Now we can look at exports. Now this segment will be a little bit longer because we're gonna talk more about OPEC and some of those international flows as some of the new data has come out. But here we just wanna to touch on real quick what's happening abroad. You know, If you look at the gasoline distillate level, We've been saying that we're going to kind of hang around these levels. Uh, Distillate is one that we think there's going to be a bit more pressure as we go through the remainder of October into November. But gasoline, we think, is just going to kind of hang at these levels. Um, Again, there was a huge surge last week in distillate, and that was really kind of getting ahead of the... um, uh, the storm. And typically you can't do both. Like you're going to do one and then you're going to move that ship out, get a new ship in, and then maybe do gasoline or some other clean product. And that's why you, we think that there's just going to be these, these shifting moves. And here you can see uh, crude oil exports had a big uh, recovery. It was up 900,000, a little over 900,000 barrels a day. Uh, reaching about 3.04 million barrels a day, which again is that makeup. You know, we there was everything was really shut down. Then you have that resurgence, which it then gets released. So it's something that's going to pair back. Again, it, we're not going to pair back to 2.1. It's going to be closer to that 2.6, 2.7 million barrels a day. Uh, so it, it'll still be strong. Again, it's not going to Europe. It's really still going into Asia. And then the question is just going to be that timing piece. And then obviously LPG had a big drop of 364,000. Again, if you look still above year over year, the five-year average, the drop is really just that timing delay. So we had that timing issue in terms of kind of where those timing um, problems come in. <clears throat> but again, that's going to be something that's just going to uh, reverse either next week or the week after, but it will still remain well above uh, the not only the year over year, but the five-year average. And the crude exports is going to be the one to watch because that's the one that we think is going to drop by about 300,000 barrels as we go through the, um, the remainder of October. And here is where we uh, start to look at those gasoline exports. You know, we had that big spike. We've talked about, you know, drifting closer towards that nine-year average. Uh, You know, based on some of the data that we've seen, some of those different additional flows, we don't think it's going to get all the way back down to that nine-year average. We think it'll just not increase a little bit, but really just kind of go sideways over the next two weeks just based on the pressure that we see in Europe, which will send more European gasoline, not only into the US, but West Africa. But Latin America has seen a little bit of a resurgence in terms of demand. And that's that'll be a benefit for US gasoline flow into Latin America. But nothing to get us back to or setting new all time high, uh, new nine year highs in this if we're looking at the seasonal chart, but just more about keeping us over that nine year average and just kind of bumping sideways as we go forward. You know, the bigger issue, and, and this is one where we, we said it was going to trend uh, on the distal side, it was going to trend closer to that nine year. We think it's going to continue to move lower, especially as we see those slowdowns in, uh, in Europe. But which is a big uh, destination for U.S. product, but we even saw you know distillate actually skipping Europe and dumping into uh, into Pad One or the West Co- or the East Coast, just because there remains a glut within Europe itself, which is why we think those slowdowns will continue and the demand for U.S. product just won't be there. And that's why we think that we're going to move closer to and and just below that nine-year average, specifically in distillate. While gasoline will provide a little bit of an uplift, we think distillate is going to be a little bit of a headwind as we go through the remainder of October. You know, as we look at U.S. Japan Fujara, uh, Japan and Fujara had a small increase. Uh, obviously, the U.S. had had a decrease. So you can see that it was almost enough to offset where we've just kind of flattened out. Uh, based on the flows that we're seeing, we think uh, Fujara is going to start to increase. And then we also think Japan is going to start to increase as well. So as we see slowdowns in the U.S. where things are kind of normalizing, we think that here... We're going to get a little bit of a shift higher in, in total inventories across three these three locations. But again, nothing. we're not going back to 1.24 billion. It's just going to be kind of this sideways move as we go through the remainder of, the, um, of October. But when we look out into the future, you know, last week and the week before, we kept saying, look, Asia is starting to build again, but not only is Asia starting to build again, we're also seeing Europe, we're seeing some additional flows in uh, storage in Europe and the North Sea. And here's just where we want to look at Asia. So here you can see Asia had a little bit of an, of an increase in floating storage. Now, India has seen a, a little bit of an increase in demand. 
which is is a net positive if we consider kind of on a seasonal level, just because they they do have their festival season, which increases some of that demand. Question is going to be: does, Do they have a COVID spread after the seasonal? But again, we'll 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 cross that bridge when we come to it. The issue is going to be China, South Korea, Japan. Uh, South Korea had a surprise to the downside on exports, which we'll talk about in the econ show. But again, it's. We don't think that we're going to get back to the Asia all-time highs, but we think that we're going to kind of sit within this level and really not see that product come out, especially as we have an addition, uh, an increase in flow coming from some key areas, which we'll talk about. Obviously, global floating storage is up. Uh, you know that that's going to be a problem because we think that global floating storage is going to continue to creep higher. And you know, if you look at uh, crude oil and transit, it's been fairly stable, but we're actually starting to see those increase. So we actually think that we're going to get, uh, you know, start to move higher in just oil and transit, just as we see additional flows coming out of these regions, which is going to increase, you know, between the amount of storage starting to increase and the amount of oil and transit. Obviously, total global uh, crude oil on the water is also going to go up as well. And the reason why is that. Like, you know, we've been talking about the issue with teapots and which is this the independent refiners in, in China and just the overall reduction in just activity within China itself. And here's you can see those operating rates have really started to come off. It's going to head closer to 70 percent, especially as we have uh, they've maxed out their their import quotas or, and you know, they have anywhere from eight to 10 percent left. Doesn't look like they're going to get a an, a an ability to to get more. But if you consider just what's been purchased, we're in October 21st, and typically you're buying four to eight weeks ahead. So they've already purchased December. So now the question is, what are they going to start doing and purchasing for January and February? And we see those purchases have been very slow, not only because they have a significant amount of crude oil and onshore storage, but we're seeing a little bit of a build in offshore storage. And it's just there remains a glut of gasoline and distillate in um, in onshore storage. And when we think about the glut there, it's come down. There's been some normalization. But again, we also had Golden Week, which is a big uh, driving you know, traveling season. That is now behind us. We have a struggling uh, local consumer, which again, we've talked about many times in previous econ shows. We're going to talk again in this econ show uh, coming out on Thursday, really kind of showing why we think some of these issues are going to be persistent, especially as we look at China. And now when we look at China crude versus refinery runs, this is what we've been talking about where, yeah, crude was imported and we did have a little bit of an increase in imports, but we have refinery runs going in the opposite direction just because we've had SOEs sh uh, slowing down, teapots slowing down, SOEs being state-owned uh, state enterprises. We did have an increase of a new facility that's been testing runs, and we did have the increase of a 70 million barrel uh, farm. So again, some of this crude oil is going into, that's been coming in as refinery runs are dipping, they're going into storage. And now, the, you know, some of the things that people have pointed to is ESPO, which is a, a quality Russian grade. You know, they've that all of a sudden there's been a price increase, so that's really good for China. It's showing China's increases. It's like, well, not particularly because there are things that adjust that, and it's really what is it paired against. So typically, the ESPO is it goes against uh, Dubai uh, spread, and, and it's weakened against dated Brent. We've also had an increase in freight prices. Again, not a huge increase in freight prices, but enough to the point where the voyage, would, can, you know, two to three days versus a month, is going to be meaningful. Six weeks from different locations. Again, those are all going to be, uh, you know, going to be factored into those price increases. And then teapots, you know, getting rid of 2020 quotas, you know, they might only be able to pull an ESPO, which is likely the only crew that they can get before 2021. So again, these are different impacts that we can see overall. You know, some of these commentaries comes from a big, uh, you know, a gentleman on uh, uh, Twitter, which is, he's uh, obviously fantastic. And these are things that are going to be impactful when we look at total spreads and differentials. Now, one of the big surprises for some, but we've been talking about for a while, is this started to see these increases in North Sea and Europe. And you can see the increases are continuing to trend higher. West Africa, as we said last week, we were going to see a, a, a drop just because some Nigerian crude spot cargoes were sold. They were moved out of storage. They've, they're now moving either, either in transit or they've gone onshore. 
the bigger issue is going to be those North Sea and European cargoes starting to rise. And if we look at the Middle East, we think that there's going to be additional increases in Middle Eastern storage, especially as we have Iraq increasing uh, by, you know, which we'll talk about. And we have Libya increasing flows, which is just going to pin more Middle Eastern crudes kind of within this location. Now, it's not going to be a huge spike, but it's just going to be something that's going to be onerous, specifically in North Sea in Europe, as we start to talk about what's happening onshore. And that's why when we look onshore oil inventories in Europe, they continue to climb. So if we look at the high of 2015 to 2019, again, thinking of that cloud, you can see that 2020 is, is pushing towards those uh, those seasonal highs clearly uh, you know and this is this is clear you can see that there's a normal storage that happens at this point in time the question is the pace because we continue to see floating storage, which is going to be pulled onshore. And obviously, we have those new cases, which are, is just a big headwind for total demand, which again is going to be an overall problem for oil inventories, especially as we have two very large refiners that are shutting down, which is just an, an overhang because uh, Italy and Spain are typically big buyers of Libya. Libya continues to flow forward, which again, just continues to be this this treadmill that we remain on, which is just going to be these headwinds as we go forward through the remainder of the year. And now this is just a quick look at uh, US, uh, no, not US, I'm, I'm sorry, when we're looking at Europe. So the top two are Europe, the bottom two are Singapore. So the ARA gas oil, you can see that remain uh, elevated, you know, not really anything too far above that normal average. We're trending higher. And the reason why we think that it's going to continue to shift up is not only do we have more imports coming in, but again, industrial production is down, uh, COVID cases are rising, gasoline is, is slowing, toll road miles are slowing, exports are slowing. Again, all of these things are just going to be an inherent headwind going forward. And the same can be said about gasoline. Now, gasoline was already trending in a negative direction if we think about you know where we sit from uh, January to, t uh, to today. And the problem is now gasoline had a, a big spike. Now we have a uh, some, some of these loadings. So we did get gasoline demand, uh, storage coming down. But again, that's just going to appear in the US. Now, if we shift to, uh, to, to Singapore, which remain at uh, either near or above uh, all-time highs, you can see that total oil products remain elevated, especially as we go through the last several years. And then middle distillate continues to push the upper bounds, which is going to be consistent, even though we've had some increase in, in exports into Europe. It's just there's not going to be enough flow through. So both of those sides, we think, are either going to remain at near all-time highs or continue to trend higher as that trend in that middle distillate level continues to be an overall headwind. And as we look at Libya, it's important to appreciate. So <clears throat> we believe that we were going to be at about 390,000 barrels a day of production by the end of the month. Instead, they're already there and now they're guiding to about 550,000 barrels by the end of the month and then a million barrels by the end of the year. We were, uh, we were assuming 750,000 barrels within six months and we're bearish oil. So just consider where, what that means for the overall market. So here, Libya seaborne oil exports were about 378,000 barrels a day for the first half of October. So not only did we were, were we expecting them to be at about 390 by the end of this month, they reached about almost 380,000 within the first two weeks. Now that's up obviously 200,000 barrels month over month. But it's, it's a matter of where is it coming from. So the initial one, according to Kepler, came from storage, which makes sense. You know, typically there's some storage, you know, get that into the market, get some cash flow, and then worry about the backfill. And we continue to see fields turn on. Uh, so the, the Abu Tifel uh, oil field restarted. So now they're pumping over 500,000 barrels. That's going to continue. And then currently the rise has been that the, Lib the Libya inventories declined by 3.64 million barrels, which is about 230,000 barrels a day. So again, that's going to, so now there's storage space, which we know those storage tanks are operational. They work, they don't have holes in them. So that's something where we're going to continue to see some of that flow through. And then in terms of the, the Zutania is, is one of the bigger areas in terms of what we've seen that flow through. And as we've talked about that, that Western, that, um, eastern part of the country continues to flow through as the western part continues to increase as we have Shahara uh, that is now flowing, which is going to just increase total flows overall. 
Now, when we think about the what's contributing, again, this is why the, the overall market is going to have a, an inherent problem of absorbing this, which is why we've seen some shifts in OPEC plus. You know, what is you know at first Russia said we're going to hold to the January uh, deal, but now they're like, well, now we have to look at where the market sits because many weren't expecting this type of flow back uh, this quickly. And then as we obviously go to uh, Iraqi exports, you know, we, we've talked about many a times they cheated in August, they cheated in September. Oh, and by the way, now they're cheating by more in October. So here you can see they're up almost 220,000 barrels uh, versus where they should be based on what the target is of about 2,600. So they, again, the targets have remained the same, August, September, Octo uh, October, and yet they continue to go higher. And it's because their, their balance sheet is in so much trouble. They have no choice but to bring dollars in because Iran can't, can't feed money in. Proxy battles are very expensive. We've been saying this time and time again. They, have, they are losing that ability to, to influence their proxies, specifically Iran. So the question is always, what happens if Biden wins the presidency? Will he unlock some of these dollars? What is that? And that's something that we're going to cover next week ahead of the... Um, Head of the election. But again, these are inherent problems where we're continuing to see uh, oil bleed out. Nigeria, same thing, you know, as we see some cuts in exports. But again, we, we just think that we're going to have about 1.75 million barrels a day of uh, in a loading schedule for December. And then Angola actually increased December, not because they have additional flow, but because deferrals from November. So they couldn't sell all of November. So now it ends up in December. Again, just more problems in the overall physical market that's going to be those headwinds. And again, as we've talked about, you know, the gasoline diesel uh, margins in Europe are terrible, uh, which is why we continue to not only see builds, but also just the amount of um, refiners coming down. So those refinery run rates will continue to, to, uh, to fall specifically through the end of October. And then as we look at gasoline, you know, this is just looking at it a little bit differently because we have the bar chart. This is just showing it on an, on the uh, Amsterdam Rotterdam uh, schedule. You can see that we're well above the five year high, which is why we continue to see those exports or we expect those exports to continue into pad one, which will just essentially lock in a, a, a better price for some of these guys. And then as we look at the global reserves, now, now I, I I just want to cl just classify, this isn't all oil. This is also gas. We've had some massive gas fines over the last five years, which is why we look at global reserves. But oil continues to be invested in, and, and that's something that is, is always talked about of, oh, well, we haven't had this huge investment, which is true, we haven't. But we also know for to a certain percentage what's down hole. Especially if you think about like just taking, for an example, Luke Oil in Iraq. So Luke Oil has been investing in Iraq. They actually wanted to increase uh, one of the fields, uh, the West uh, Kerna too, from the, which they own 75% of. They wanted to go to about 480,000 barrels a day from 400. Instead, they had to go down to 280 to help Iraq try to meet these flows. But at the same time, they're still investing. There's, they still, they're, they're now investing in block 10. Uh, they think they can get to about 550,000. And just based on some of the investments in Iraq, again, Iraq is a very you know, volatile place to say the least, but they do have export capacity that they've built for 5 million barrels a day. Now, can they get to 5 million? No, I don't think they can get to 5 million. But that doesn't mean the rock says they can't. The geology is there. There is a certain amount of, if there could ever find some, a certain amount of stability, they could see a meaningful increase in flow. Again, not anything back to 5 million, but to see an additional 500,000 barrels come out of I Iraq isn't unreasonable or impossible to think about, especially as you as just using Luke oil as an, as an example. Because again, it's it's more conventional, it, it's lower cost, it's in a warm climate where you know Russia is fighting against obviously Siberia and the cold. So again, there is investment in different pockets, specifically in the neutral zone in Iraq. And again, Libya has some low hanging fruit. And if we're starting to think about adjusting decline curves, you know, did I overinvest in shale? Where can I go? Some of these places do offer some of that low hanging fruit. Again. I'm not talking about an immediate turn on because it will take investment, but if the offshore space takes 10, it takes eight to 10 years, you know, the onshore space in some of these areas could be anywhere from 18 months to two years, depending on how much fixed infrastructure is already there. 
And this is just looking at some of those sanctions as we talk about Iran and Venezuela. You know, could president, could a, a new president, uh, you know, if Biden gets elected, could we see an adjustment? I don't think it would be a huge adjustment and it won't be right away, but it would be kind of showing you where that unlock can be. Venezuela needs a lot of investment. I'm not saying Venezuela come, comes back that quick, uh, that quickly, but Iran has been trying to maintain and there is a significant amount of low hanging fruit within Iran, which would attract investment. Now, it obviously wouldn't come from the US right away, but you would have Europe, you would have um, uh, Russia. As you can see, a lot of these nations, uh, especially European nations, withheld from increase uh, from uh, uh, voting to uh, keep the arms embargo uh, with Iran on the UN level. You've saw them abstain. Uh, they, they still continue to want to hold to the nuclear agreement. So again, th there is that demand to see some of those investments in, into Iran. Again, not it wouldn't be um, immediate, but it, it, you could quickly see a million barrels a day increase out of Iran, not only just from storage, but also from some of these chokebacks and some of these uh, slowdowns that we've seen due to sanctions. So this is why we, we remain relatively concerned in terms of just that, that growth in oil price and why we think there's going to be those continuing headwinds in the physical market as we continue to see this slowdown in demand coming from you know, low refinery rates, low demand rates. And it's just then as supply is creeping higher, demand is, is creeping a little bit lower, which is just going to lead to a, a problem, especially as we look going out over the next couple, uh, couple of months. So thanks again for watching. Uh, tomorrow we have our econ show, which uh, we're going to film today. So you know, we'll hopefully we don't get a, a huge shakeup in terms of what's happening in the U.S. government. And then obviously everyone's favorite, the primary vision for X spread count. So thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. <laughs>